Ok, bienvenue tout le monde, bonjour, welcome online and in person to Concordia University's fourth space. So happy you could join us today for day four of Research That Matters, Sustainability, Biodiversity and Justice in a Time of Ecological Crisis. This morning's workshop, Playing in the Dirt, is happening live here in fourth space. We have some participants uh, joining our host, Andrea Tremblay, here in the space. Uh, so excited. And some of you um, might be joining us online as well, so you're more than welcome to um, turn on your camera and participate as much as you can from, um, I was going to say outer space, but <laughs> from cyberspace. Just to situate everyone, we are streaming to YouTube live from Fourth Space, which is located on unceded indigenous lands in Jogge, Montreal. And we'd like to extend our gratitude to the Kanyankahaga Nation for their caretakers, for the lands and waters we're meeting on, for their teachings about the earth and our relations. Uh, if you're new to Fourth Space, welcome once again. We work with our university community here to mobilize and exchange knowledge by co-creating these sorts of daily activities, workshops, podcasts, conversations, and so on, to connect people to what's going on at Concordia. So it's our pleasure to have uh, to continue to participate in this week's activities um, and this conference that's happening across many spaces here on both campuses. Um, what did I else that I want to say? Oh yes, I'm just reminding you the use of microphones. So if you're in the space, we left some handheld mics there for you. If you could please use those so we could hear you online. And if you're online, once again, the chat is activated if you prefer that space. Otherwise, you're welcome just to, to speak if you have something to say. Okay, it's my, now my pleasure to pass it over to Jim Grant. Hi, Jim. Hi, Anna. Thank you for that introduction. And thanks to Anna, Doug, and the Fourth Space crew for for hosting us, partnering in our conference again this year. So on behalf of the Loyola Sustainability Research Center and Loyola College for Diversity and Sustainability, welcome, day four, event one. We're really excited. Uh, day four of our conference this week. Um, thank you for that territorial acknowledgement. It's particularly important for our work, which is about land, dirt, uh, to acknowledge uh, you know, the owners of this land. And uh, if you are, uh, most of us are from Jojoge, but if you're online from outside of Montreal, I encourage you to you know, learn more about the land on which you are situated. So, okay, on to playing with dirt with Andrea Tremblay. So Andrea needs no introduction to the LSRC community. She's, I would think, perhaps the most engaged, energetic graduate student in the, the whole center. But just a brief introduction, what can I tell you about Andrea? Andrea. Uh, she's a, a third year PhD student in our Indie program, which is an incredible interdisciplinary program at Concordia, very unique to our institution. Uh, Kim Sachak is her, um, is her supervisor. In 2019, while doing an MA in Media Studies, she created the Mind Mouth Heart Garden in the Loyal Campus, which is now you know, a, a central part of Concordia's sustainability activities, including li living labs. Um, and uh, I just liked, I'm just, Thank Andrea for being such a energetic participant of this conference year after year. We really appreciate it. So thank you, Andrea, and take it away. Am I not muted? <laughs> All right. Um, so this is a participatory uh, workshop, but I will kind of talk at you for a few minutes just to kind of situate um, like the purpose of the workshop. Um, so, in a paper published in 2020, Professor Pierre Pong from the Department of Social Science and Humanities, welcome in, uh, at King Mountut's University of Technology in Thamburi, highlights that a lack of anticipation of benefits derived from urban nature might be a cause for alarm, particularly if there's indeed a legitimate displacement of nature-based contact via the omnipresent screen. And the erosion of our connection to nature may be obscuring its perceived benefits. Research shows um, that young adults in university settings continue to have minimal awareness and, uh, of and concern about global climate change and other environmental issues. Pia Pong also calls for educational methods to, that provide possibilities of experiencing the emotional and philosophical aspect of traditional subject matters, as well as academic components. It has also been demonstrated that being exposed to or enjoying green spaces in urban environment is not sufficient to educate and trigger environmental stewardship in urbanites. Let's see if this works.
Um, yeah, like this. <laughs> it's not changing this slide. <laughs> anyway, so I have four objectives. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I have four objectives in this workshop. So one, I want to start by sharing a few stories that illustrate why the exercises we will do in the second part are important. Two, we will talk about dirt and play in the dirt. And three, we're going to plant seeds or seedlings. And three, we will share reflections um, before we conclude. So how did you do this? <laughs> um, so before we start, I invite you to think about your favorite mode of reflecting on things, whether it's like um, taking notes, uh, taking pictures with your phone, you're welcome to take pictures, um, or also while you're doing things, while you'll be manipulating soil, um, or even uh, like a verbal recording on your phone, I do that a lot. Um, so yeah, just to think about if you have thoughts, insight, or questions, so that you, you know, when there's a moment that you could express them. Um, and at the end, we will share, hopefully. Uh, there is a QR code on the slide in, uh, that links to a Google document um, that you could put questions and, and uh, comments on there now and after the thing. So um, I'm not gonna talk much about my research with the garden, uh, but so my, my focus is really on env environmental justice and interactive intergenerational access to land uh, for marginalized communities. So, but one aspect that I'm particularly interested in exploring is this dance between temporality and materiality. Um, and one way that I do this is through stories. So today, more than half of the world's population lives in urban areas. In the province of Quebec, this number is over 80 percent and around the world the relationship that many urbanites have to the food they consume is connected to grocery store displays of mass-produced items wrapped and sealed in uh, attractive packaging or enhanced and processed with additives into branded food stuff so we have currently generations of individuals who are who have little to no contact to the way food grows, little understanding about what goes into the food they consume every day and little awareness and care about what it would take to produce food regeneratively to feed the world's population. So most people living in city are too busy to worry about whether the few companies who control the world's food production care about anything but the profits they make uh, year after year. So, while we have the capacity to produce enough food to feed the planet uh, using regenerative methods, the current food system is part of a neoliberal free market principles and a culture that is detrimental to the attainment of this objective. So the lack of engagement plays an important part in the climate, health, economic, and social crises we're witnessing at this time, and particularly at the high level of um, food insecurity around the world with Canada showing numbers of 20 to 40% of people in uh, suffering from food insecurity. So recently I had the good fortune to spend some time in Mexico City for the Visualizing uh, Food Waste Field School. And I met wonderful people from Mueres de la Tierra, Mueres de la Periferia Colectivo, who bring together women and children who are working to strengthen peasant agricultural practices and ind indigenous cuisine. So we met um, also the Cocina Collaboratorio and Humedalia AC Organización uh, dedicated to preservation and sustainability of the wetlands in Mexico. So with these activists, we spent two days uh, learning about their work, struggles, and I was stricken by the way both of these groups are working against this contrasting backdrop of industrialization and urbanization that has destroyed traditional ways of life in their country. Uh, in each of these encounters, we were taken away uh, from the dense pop pollution in the city where we were staying into the fields and into small communities where you really felt like you had been taken into another world, another time. Um, 
there was a lot of poverty, um, but also there was a lot of, like you could see a cohesion of community. Um, so with these people, we prepared, we worked at preparing traditional foods, um, where the, like they're trying to bring back soil ecology. So we, we visited the farm um, and they also, they're trying to undo, they're trying to educate people about the, the way urban life and is sort of damaging people's health. Um, because just like here, this is what we now understand as food, like the food that is sold in the city and grocery stores. Um, everybody was asking me, did you go to the Walmart? And <laughs> I did not go to the Walmart. <laughs> um, so this way of eating also they were telling us is uh, the same way as here and, and a lot of places in the world is leading to a lot of health issues uh, for the Mexican population. So with what is La Tierra, we took the time to grind grains of corn uh, that had been soaked and we used stones and we rolled the grains, we made it into flour. Uh, we then added water and we made uh, little balls and flattened them to make tortillas that we cooked on uh, wood burning stoves. Uh, while doing this work, we were, you know, 50 people sitting around, uh, sort of moving around and talking and having tea. Um, with Casina Collaboratorio, uh, we traveled on barges um, through polluted waters that go through farmlands, uh, many of them abandoned. Uh, because as I was told, since the industrial giants have moved in, um, they, they are, they've basically killed uh, the soil ecology. And um, so the, the, the land is, is, is very difficult to cultivate and to grow anything from it for these farmers that are left there. Um, so before anyone could grow something, they have to rebuild the soil, which is, becomes costly, right? Um, so one struggle of each of these groups is that also few people now have the skills and the desire to take the time to bring back these ways to cultivate the land and to cook healthy traditional food that would in fact bring back health and rebuild communities uh, in Mexico. So I was told that when people come, they quickly abandon because the soil, like I just said, is, is dead and needs so much work and needs money investment. Um, and people don't have the patience or the skills. On this trip, I also met a PhD student from the University of Winnipeg, whose name is Gifty Zorka. Um, she's from actually Ghana, and we, she shared how um, she grew up in a village in Ghana where women used to gather around to make a meal uh, based of corn. So again, the women would spend some time in community grinding the corn, making it into flour, they would add things and so that would create a meal that was um, edible like finger food so at the end of the day when the community uh, would like when it was dinner time they would come and just like eat this food with their hands and like kind of like you know like we do at a, a cocktail party kind of thing like, but it, this was an, a daily event but so yeah this is about like what can you put put, put <laughs> in the soil to sort of create, increase the sponge and, and increase the ability for the roots to reach out. Then I also uh, brought some um, organic fertilizers. Um, this is called uh, activator de sol, uh, soil activator. Um, and so this, this you require just a little bit. It helps. All these things basically help build the soil. So I have different ones here alfalfa meal. Um, so you're feel free to open these and because you're gonna we're gonna be making um, some soil. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is you could take a container and I do invite you to use your hands. That's like the idea is really to use your hands to work playing in the dirt. Um, you could add perlite, but you don't need to. There's already some in here. But you could also add vermiculite afterward. Vermiculite does a little bit of the same thing as perlite does. Um, so you could add some to it. But uh, vermiculite also has the advantage that it will not mold, it will not feed bacteria. So 
and I mean, Perlite won't either, but like things like, um, things like some of these things, like if you put too much of it, uh, it might. So first you're gonna put an amount of soil. You could take a container. Did you have a thing? Oh, you did. You, did you take a container? You have. Okay. You're very self-sufficient people. <laughs> so here, it's okay. I'm just gonna move this out of the way. So um, yeah, you could take a uh, start with soil. So we're gonna start with a little bit of soil. Be careful, these have wheels. <laughs> so you don't wanna push them too fast, but here. And we don't need this. So there you go. Do you this mostly help like soil structure? Kind of thing? Yes. Like, just to have something that isn't necessarily like nutrient dense. Right. It kind of like help. Okay. There's even this guy, I mean I, I try, I'm trying it now, uh, who suggests actually to plant seedlings with just this and um, a compost of some sort. So not even to put soil. Um, I find that weird. But again, if you think of the idea, it's just seedlings, right? It's just for a few weeks yeah, until we so. plant them outside. So it's fine. Like, they, like I said, the seed has everything it needs to feed that little plant for weeks, right, already. So it does not necessarily need the, the um, like the, the chemicals that are going to feed it from the soil itself. But, it, you know, I, I just found that weird. So I did a few seedlings with it. And then I said, OK, let's do my regular mix. Yeah. And I mix the two, and I mix it with that. So what you do is do you do about, I do about half of this, and then um, a quarter and a quarter. Yeah. There actually is a vermin compost. Yes, I actually was, I wanted uh, to involve them in this okay. workshop and I wanted to get some, but I, we, we never connected, yeah, no, so. Yeah, I know some of the students. They're yeah. Busy, so yeah, yeah, they're super busy. Yeah, that's really cool. yeah. so, but it would have been kind of cool, but that may be for a next Can workshop. <laughs> oh, sorry, thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, all right, so you can go ahead, just, you could, I could make it with you, so if you want if to maybe show. Um, yeah. I'm not, I don't know the time. Oh, it's 10.30. Oh, no, uh, you could stop. It. Yeah, it, you could leave it there for a second, maybe, because it just gives you the list of, um, like, for people, if there's people online. Uh, the list of what we're using. Um, I could put a link also to the informative, um, um, like the document I have. I will put that there in a minute. Um, just, you're applying. Like, just uh, put, like, just, oh, uh, you don't have to fill it. Like, I would put, I don't know, four handfuls of dirt. So like the, I've been going. go go to four or five, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, yeah, so you'll see like there are little sticks. There's, uh, I like to feel the texture. Mm -hmm. So then you put about approximately, it's not a perfect science. Um, you put about a quarter, half of what you just put in this um, coconut shreds or choir it's called <laughs> but like i said it's not an exact science you could just like add on and then so i just like to say it because this is it's a vermicompost so it's basically warm poo right yeah. Um, just for in case and someone doesn't know, <laughs> but it's a it's a big uh, component in soil, right? Like if, uh, so, I think it's important to include it in this in making our soil. So this would be like a really nice, rich garden soil, you know, if you wanted to. And when you plant your seedlings, they'll be um, or seeds, they'll be actually be able to stay in this for a while. Um, because it has a lot of nutrients. 
So once you have a little bit of everything, um, you could choose, like you don't have to put every single um, like fertilizer that's here. But it's nice to put a few. So this is, yeah, so I, these one I put spoons um, just because, yeah. So this is interesting. This is mycorrhiza um, that they grinded. And I think it's interesting. This is um, seaweed. Uh, I usually use it in a liquid form in the garden. Um, but this one is in a powder form. So you could also, so these you don't need a lot. So you would, it says about like 5% of your whole soil should be uh, composed of that. So you put a little bit of this, like you could put it just a little bit. Um, and you could, you, could, you could use every one, but you could also, uh, cricket yeah, cricket manure. I just never used it. Is that, <laughs> is that what it is? I think they're raising them now to, to just do that. But this is cricket poo. <laughs> well, we have, um, we have the worm poo. So bone meal is to amend, where is it from? So bone meal um, is from bones. Well, that's from leftovers, that's animals. Yes. I mean, I guess you could have a vegan version of it, if that's your concern. Yes. Uh, but they're used for different things. So the bone meal would be to adjust, let's say you need extra calcium um, or extra other minerals, which I wrote all down here. Um, and maybe you know. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't like, yeah, <laughs> the company Golf Green, I didn't quite get. Are they? Well, that's not good. It's the first time I bought it. Yeah, I just saw, when I saw Golf Green, I thought, mm. um, so which one I was looking, bone meal. Oh, it's right there. Um, so it increases, bone meal increases phosphorus in soil for optimal blah, 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 uh, and is good for the development of strong root systems. Uh, yeah, it stays in the dirt, in the soil uh, for months. Uh, yeah, and it helps deliver the nutrients and calcium, of course. I use it mainly for calcium in the garden. So, I mean, what are we going to be doing? We're gonna, you're gonna you take a pot and then you're gonna put some of the, your soil in the pot and then you're gonna transplant either a seedling or you, I brought some seeds. Sorry? Depending on our choice of planting, we'll choose the different types of herbs. You could, but it's not really important for today. Like if you were to, if you were to like have your garden outside and you would do probably a soil analysis, and you would see what you need, or we, you would look at your plants and see, oh, these plants need, you know, phosphorus, or they need more calcium, and then you would select. But for the purpose of today, is really we're looking at how to make a soil um, that will be nutrient dense. You don't actually have to add any of these. It's, it's more to show, like that you could, right? I'm just saying that. So I added, for instance, the seaweed, because I know it's just good all around. I added, what did I add? There's some of the cricket uh, one, because it's also um, a good, has a lot of nutrients. Um, I'm not going to necessarily put limestone, because uh, that's something I usually add to amend the soil. Like, for instance, I don't know right now if the soil is too acidic or too uh, alkaline. So you would use limestone for something like that, like to make it more alkaline or, or less. So, yeah. So the idea that I'm to bring these things to, is really to show. Yeah. 
Yeah, but the mycorrhiza, also, oh, that's what I added. Yeah, it's kind of like. It, it, it's, it brings nutrients, it helps the roots um, absorb the nutrients in the soil. So that is, see, that's something that you would add regardless of what you're planting, right? Because it's just, it's, and these things are also uh, from natural sources, but it's just a mixture. It's just, I brought everything so just to show really, but again, like I said, uh, the, the seaweed, uh, the mycorrhiza, and even the alfalfa, I would probably add just because it's like it cannot cause harm. Yeah, and I think also like the mycorrhiza, it's important to try to recreate the natural environment of the soil when you're doing like a garden. Yes. Um, because like in the natural state, there's a bunch of living organisms within the soil. There's there's the insects. Um, there's even like decomposing animals. Yes, exactly. Soil, That's what soil is avoid. made of. Bone meal would go in, mycorrhiza, alfalfa, like... <laughs> um, oh, there's a question. Oh, Sorry, okay. continue. Um, and so it's just like recreate what would naturally be in the soil and try to recreate that like environment and like nutrient dense. What yes. Would we want to be the nutrient dense soil. Right. But if you were also to take a soil that has like like in these farmlands, for instance, like and where there's it's been so over treated with chemicals and stuff, you would you would need like to really um, create something really powerful, right? To with a lot of nutrients to rebuild the soil and probably use also some uh, plant amending. Like there's plants that interact with the soil that are, that feed the soil, right? As well. So you would you would use a mixture of things, but but these are just like you would use organic um, elements, right? Yeah, and it's also seeing like what agricultural practices are being done on the soil that can like slowly rebuild it while still producing. So yeah, it's like a it's a balance that needs to be like spoken of, and also like just yeah, it's hard to be sustainable in like an unsustainable system. Like yeah, you're saying yeah. So it's like. Um, the soil and the agricultural system needs to change so for like an sustainable future but yeah, for no, sure it's super interesting for sure yeah. there was also oh hi how are you come and play in the dirt we were almost done but you could you have time so here here come you could um take a container here come so um this is soil, <laughs> this is coconut shreds, and this is vermicompost. So what you do to start with, you kind of put, um, I don't know, four handful of dirt, four or five. It's not an exact science. And then you, you could put about half of, the, of what amount of soil you put. You could put that of the coconut core, and then about the same amount uh, as the coconut core of vermicompost and then you could that would make some soil that you could sort of play in for a minute and before you plant a seed okay, you want to do that good. yeah sure what's your name i'm celine celine nice to meet you i'm andrea um mode i don't think there's silly questions but um yeah i did not know that worms are not native to this land No, maybe you have the answer. Does somebody here have the answer? Any idea what was the fulfilling, what was fulfilling the role of vermicompost prior to their introduction? No, vermi, two different things. You have these. Um... Hello. <laughs> Sorry. Watching you on the screen, it's okay, and I just answered Maud's question. Which oh, did you? Well, so can you no, answer we, it for I, us? Well, I can. I can. I oh, can, can you? I can, I, you can answer it. Okay, go ahead. The 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 nightcrawler type big worms that we see in our compost are not native. Vermicompost are red worms. Okay, they're little ones, different species. So, I think they're native. They're not non-native. No. But I know like a lot of lot of stuff was brought 
like a lot of plants are blocked from the old world. Yes. And obviously they put them in pots and uh, whatever container they have, probably ceramic, I don't know. And, and then they brought them over here, they brought in, you know, whatever they use in the soil, right? So Interesting, worms, yeah. Like pathogens, whatever, they just brought everything. Thank you. But Thank you. The, there are some decom natural decomposers. Like, yeah. like, there's like um, potato bugs that are flat and they roll up. They're really good in your compost. There's a number of other creatures yeah. that are really... So there are tons of arthropods and microorganisms that play a role in soil decomposition. But we haven't had native earthworms here in 10,000 years. So but they've the taken over to dig up any earth anywhere yeah, in any Except in Victoria. <laughs> really? Victoria Busy. I only know this because Michael, who is a graduate student of Carly's, gave a talk on his earthworm project. That's yesterday. fascinating. And he said, yeah, they have a tiny little population of earthworms, native earthworms that survived the glaciation in Victoria. But most of them went oh. extinct because they couldn't survive the ice. Great question. So, great question. <laughs> there are lots and lots of things that, I mean, the worms are what you see, right? But uh, there's a lot of little there, little guys that are working really hard. Yes, yes, <laughs> we didn't talk about that. Form. We didn't bring microorganisms. Oh, I <laughs> very essential. Oh, I don't know how to turn these off. Um, yeah, so maybe we'll take containers. So if you want to plant seeds, you could take these. <laughs> if you could separate them. <laughs> Yes, uh, but if you want to plant like the seedlings over there, you could um, use these because they're quite a bit bigger. Again, you have to take them apart. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, most of these things I get at Urban Seedling um, in Verdun. Uh, they're my go-to for all the garden stuff. Not just for products, but for their knowledge too. They're very generous in uh, sharing their knowledge always. For any questions, usually. Uh, this though, I got, I, where did I get that? I think I got that online, but I, it says organic, but it, with the brand Golf Green. <laughs> My kids always tell me, you have to look at things before you buy things online, but okay. Uh, but when I saw the Golf Green, I said, okay, maybe look for locally produced cricket manure. I'm sure there's Quebec people that produce cricket Oh, or that? I mean, I usually put chicken manure in the garden. Yeah, I usually do that. So here we have, uh, we have sage. Uh, sage, sage. I don't know what this one is. <laughs> uh, we have lavender. It's always a f favorite of mine, mine anyways. Um, romarin. What's in English? Romarin. Rosemary. So rosemary. Do we have another bin just to store these in? Someone we're going to have to public transport. Back. Oh we gosh! You could, you yeah, Grab you could take one of those. Bin. Yes. Thank you. So uh, sage. This is lavender. Which one is this? And this is rosemary. Oh, and there's chives and mint. Hi. <laughs> and more rosemary. So yeah, so just pick what you <laughs> is this that fit? Yeah. I could I, I could mean, Okay. Sorry, they don't. But it, it's it's really for the idea of massaging it and and playing in it and thinking that um, like I wouldn't necessarily not I would not necessarily put bone meal, but 
I would, you could put alpha alpha male that would not cause any harm, right? Um, like you don't, yeah, you, this one, where is the seaweed? Like, yeah, the, it's over there. The seaweed uh, is also always a good. So I also. Yeah, I didn't open those. Uh, Alfalfa is actually, uh, it's that. It's like a clover, yeah. 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 But when you add it, it, it gives nutrients to, uh, to the soil, really. I want to hear that. <laughs> um, I think like one big thing about like being connected to the land, but also to the food that's being grown is like for me, I, I recently like got really in, like at the beginning of the pandemic, got really, really into cooking. And I realized like the in good ingredients just make you feel better. So yes. I've, um, and through my thesis and in interviewing farmers, um, I'm actually gonna go volunteer at a organic farm this summer. And also um, they have these like, community baskets you can get of like fruits and veggies. And it just helps you feel more, well, you're connected to who's growing it. Yes. And it makes you feel more, not involved, but like more connected to the land and to the food that's being grown. It just makes you feel less, like, I, I feel like I, when I have those baskets, I somehow like don't want to consume as much other things. Yes. Because I'm, I'm so aware of how much effort it takes to grow those things and how much the farmers care about what they're growing that I... I tend to just like yeah I'll and I get I try to buy more seasonally it's also cheaper but and it's just being more aware I think that's a big thing a hundred percent where it's coming from a hundred percent that is something I see in the garden at the Mind Heart Mouth Garden with mm. you know student volunteers or even older adults who are volunteering it's an intergenerational garden mm. um, but I definitely see that everybody says that. You know, you're leaving because if you volunteer for as little as an hour in the garden, you're leaving with some of the produce, right? Um, and so um, everybody says that after you've worked and you're like, you have, you acquire like a really different uh, perspective on food. And if you're like, you've been working with, you know, um, trimming and, and, and looking for bugs under lettuce and under kale and whatnot, and you're, you're taking some home it's very you're gonna eat healthier like and then it's in your fridge and you you worked at growing this food and so i see that all the time and i have people that would they're telling me like especially if people are a little you know a bit tight uh, with money food insecure like they tend you can't necessarily buy a lot of vegetables vegetables are so expensive now so like if you're able to take some home it adds to your you know your your diet to like to the food you eat you consume in a week and so yeah it, it really changes um your not just your relationship but to food but also the way you want to eat like yeah you're you're not you're you're likely to eat healthier after volunteering in a garden as you just said um it's a very thing i see all the time how's that going it's ready <laughs> So do you think you want to plant a seedling or would you prefer planting seeds? So seeds, we have some lettuce, uh, some kale and some uh, chives, but you also have chives there ready to eat. <laughs> uh, yeah, God does it. Yeah, they, that's where they're from. I did plant kale, but it wasn't quite ready. So uh, 
like I said, Urban Seedling is amazing and they, they've always been incredibly big. Yes, they're great. So you could, you feel free to um, take pots or a pot and you're going to take it home. <laughs> no, 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 you put in all this nurturing and, and you're, that's for you to take that, you, this soil. You're going to put it in a container and um, right uh, maybe if you have a bag or I don't I didn't bring bags but I actually have bags in there but they're not but this it won't it won't really come out once you, yeah but it's I have another one of it. it it's limestone there's another container yeah well it's a it's a good thing right Yeah, so if you want to plant seeds, I could open those for you. Here, like, let's make some room. But that's okay. It won't, once you put your, once, it won't come out. It won't all fall out. Well, you could. Yeah, it will actually. That's a great idea. I don't know. I don't have paper towels though, but maybe they do. I have rags. So, did you want to plant kale or did you want to use some of these? You will. Okay. Um, so, then you could use, I mean, you could use also the big pot and just. You can just use your soil and fill it up in here. And then I'll open this. Hello, all. Um, keep playing. We're just going to shut down the, uh, the force space, let force space get organized for the next event. Andrea, thank you so much You're for yet another <laughs> wonderful <laughs> event. Thanks to all the participants. And on behalf of LSRC, Come to more events today and tomorrow. So thanks very much.